Morning, Eddie. Morning, Razor. Firstly, can we just check on some of the players who um, were getting treatment at Manchester United? Fabian Scher limped off towards the end. Is he okay? Fabian's fine. He's uh, been nursing a, a foot injury for a while now. Um, this is a long term thing. Uh, he's managed it very well. Um, just sort of reared its head a little bit towards the end of the game, but I think he'll be fine. Um, and the likes of Trippier, Bruno, Botman, um, are they all okay? Is everyone fine from Sunday? I think we're assessing everybody. I think uh, when you have the the three game weeks as we're in the middle of now, I think every day you wake up, the players will feel better for a night's sleep. So um, yeah, hopefully we, everyone will be okay, but we'll wait and see. John Joe Shelby was on the bench on Sunday. First time we've seen him in the squad since pre-season. What is the plan for getting him back onto the pitch now that he's returned from that hamstring injury? Well, I think the key thing is his training. So we are continuing to work him very hard. He's still in the, the process of the very early stages of coming back. So um, he would only enter the pitch at the moment in a, an absolute emergency for us. Um, we're building his load, we're building his training time, but he's looking really good and he's done very well um, to this point. He's as fit as I've seen him, to be honest. So in a great place, but we just want to be careful with him in these latter stages of uh, his injury. You've been without Carl Darlow for a few weeks now because of injury. How is his recovery going? It's going well. Yeah, he's on the grass. He's with the goalkeepers. Um, not necessarily full training, but um, in the, again, the latter stages of his recovery. So uh, positive signs for Carl. As we go into these midweek matches in the Premier League, Newcastle have the best defensive record in the division. How pleasing is that for you? Yeah, very pleasing. I think it's a compliment to the players, their mentality to um, defending. And we, we very much have the mindset here that we want to defend as a team, uh, right from the, the strikers filtering all the way back to the goalkeeper. And I think you can see that when we play this season. The uh, collective ambition is to um, be a really good team in and out of possession. It's an ever-changing thing. Yeah, we can't uh, rest on our laurels or take what we've done at this point for granted. Um, and every challenge is so unique in the Premier League. So now we come up against an Everton team that will give us um, a different test to the one we've just faced at Old Trafford, but hopefully one we can come through. The two previous managers here talked a lot about getting the balance right between defending and attacking and some of the challenges they faced. Do you feel, and you talk there about the entire team defending and it being about the unit, that you are striking the right sort of balance with that? Well, we have the same mindset with the ball as well. We attack as a, as a, a team as well. Um, I think that comes from our training. I think we're, we try to be very um, brave and uh, aggressive in all forms, whether we're attacking or defending. We, we try and empty ourselves to go for um, perfection. So that's a, a difficult uh, bar to hit, but we're, we're trying to get there. I just want to ask you about one player, Ryan Fraser, who came on in the second half at Manchester United. He's been in and out of the starting eleven this season, but had a good run for you earlier this year. What's the challenge for him now to try and get back to the, the levels that he showed towards the end of last season? I think the challenges for him are um, he's competing against some very good players for his position. If you look at last year, he, was, he made the position his own, really, by how he performed. So when I came in, I think he... Um, dovetailed really well with Maxi and the two of them were excellent and then um, latterly towards the end of the season Miggy then played and since then Miggy's I think been very consistent and all the way through pre-season Miggy's really um, grasped his opportunity so Ryan will get his moments and chances to to shine um, I love him as a player I love him as a person um, I only want good things for him so when he plays he has to do well and finally you touched on Everton a few moments ago but do you feel that they have improved since the end of last season when they were fighting relegation? Definitely, they've made progress. I'd say uh, the games we had against them last season were both very tight. Um, difficult games, I think, I'd think i say, for both teams. Not a lot in it. We anticipate a very similar test. I think they have improved. I think they've recruited well. I think they've got a real physical edge to their side now. Um, there'll be threats on transitions, set plays, um, a physical team. So, yeah, we're going to have to stand up to that physical test. But at home, with the crowd, you know, I back us to do that. Thank you. Thanks, Rosie. Okay. Good morning, Andy. Um, apologies if you missed, if you mentioned it on Sunday and I, and I missed it um, through not being there. Was there an update at all or any definitive on um, Sir Maximin and any uh, and that? Because obviously they missed it the weekend. Yes. Um, so, Alex, we don't think we'll see again before the World Cup. So, unfortunately, he ha he's had a setback on his thigh. 
Um, Maxi's had a very, very uh, minor irritation to his hamstring, but it's the third time that that's happened. So, although it is a very minor injury um, because of the reoccurrence, uh, we might have to be careful with his time scales. But we hope to see him before um, the World Cup break. On Isak, it's obviously been a stop start beginning for him. Um, how difficult is that for him, and I suppose for you guys as well, because he looked electric on his, on his debut, of course, at Liverpool, and <coughs> frustrating for everyone. Yeah, very frustrating for him as a new player coming to a new league club. Um, you want to make an instant impact, and he did that in the team in those first few games. I thought he was excellent for us. Um, looked like he was acclimatising really well. Picked up the injury when he was away with Sweden, uh, and since then been frustrating for him because he felt really, really good. Yeah. Did a lot of work to get fit, and as always with muscle injuries, they're unpredictable. They're difficult. You can feel great one minute and then succumb the next, and that's what happened to him. And it's a real shame because he's desperate to to make his mark here, but he's young. He's got a long future ahead of him here, and now we need to protect him and make sure he comes back good. I suppose um, the positive, if you want to take it from that, is that he's not going to get rushed into going and play in the World Cup because he won't be there. It'll give you some time to get him ready for the, the restart. Yeah, I think that's the, the beauty of this. If you're trying to look for a positive, is that we will get a chance, hopefully, for his injury to heal, um, and then we will get a mini pre season with him to get him in peak physical condition. And I think. When he joined us, I think he joined us with a very minor hamstring problem. So even when he played against Liverpool, he wasn't at 100% fitness. So hopefully this gives us an opportunity to get him to his peak physical condition so he can show his athletic capabilities. I mean, he is an incredible athlete and he will, in my opinion, do really well for us for a long period of time. So this is an important time now to bed him into the team, to get to know the players, the city, um, and then come back firing. How punishing is it for the team in general Missing players like Isak, St. Maximin, Joel Linton, and Callum Wilson as well at different stages in these opening 10 matches of the season. How much has that affected your start to the season, do you think? I think it's definitely had an impact, but I'm not going to sit here and use those things as excuses. It's the reality of a Premier League season where, probably like no other, you've got condensed games, um, testing times, a lot of international football um, on players' minds as well. So I think it's a totally different mix to any other season that I've known. I think you're seeing around the Premier League probably more injuries than ever. Uh, lots of different clubs, which is concerning really, because obviously we want to protect our players and try and keep them fit and well. But the Premier League, and probably we're a cause of that, is getting quicker and quicker and quicker. The intensity is so great that players are, are breaking around the country now. It's our job to try and keep that to a minimum. I think you suggested a couple of weeks ago that you were looking into it here at the training ground due to the number of soft tissue injuries that has been. Are you any further forward with that? Is, that? is that something you're still looking into? Well, touch wood, we haven't had any fresh injuries for a while. I think the problem here is when you have uh, reoccurring injuries, and I said this after the game against Manchester United, they're a, a, a double hammer blow for us because you're always going to get fresh injuries, but if you don't get your injuries back that you've had, um, the situation can look difficult. So that's on us, really. That's on us as a medical team, sports science team, to um, make sure that doesn't happen. Just finally, for me, I noticed a little stat raiser there talking about you being top of the league in terms of um, defence and concession of goals. You're also top of the league in terms of hitting the woodwork this season. What, is it, what does that say to you about your start to the season? I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure if that's a good one or a bad one. Uh, certainly, we've been unlucky in certain moments. I think Joe Linton especially, I can think of three immediately that spring to mind for him uh, personally. But I, I think that's a good sign, really, overall, because it means you're creating chances. And um, yes, we might not have taken them all in the manner that we want to, but certainly we are we are creating those openings that we need. Andy? Well, Nettie, well, uh, 15 points reached. It took Newcastle 22 games, I think, last season to do that. What's pleased you most about the progression of this team this season? I'd probably say looking as a... Uh, Pulling back and looking as, a, as an overview, probably our overall performances. Uh, near enough every game, I've been proud of uh, the effort given, the commitment shown. I think when you're, you're seeing a group of players trying to implement a plan, trying to implement a style, and giving their all to deliver that, I think when you're sat here, that's all you can ask for. Then you, then you want the quality and you want the delivery to be um, as good as it can be. And I think we're working towards that. But I can't fault the players here for how they've attacked, how brave they've been, um, the energy, the physical effort shown. I can't fault anybody. Lots of standout performers, certainly in the defence. Uh, Razor was mentioned there, you know, best defensive record in the Premier League at the minute. Sven Botman, though, where do you feel he could be in terms of top Premier League defenders in years to come, given the start he's had to his Newcastle career? 
difficult. I don't want to put any unnecessary pressure on him, um, but my faith in him is, is huge. I, I think we really fought to sign him and it was a long um, battle to get to him. We, we faced competition from other clubs, but we, we really stuck to our guns because we felt he was the one that we wanted. And I think he's rewarded that show of faith because I just see so much potential in his game. I think he's very, very good on the ball. I've said that from day one. And he surprised me really with how good his technical delivery has been and how composed he's been in what is a very frantic league. That composure is really valuable. Defensively, I think he's got um, all the tools. He needs to work and develop certain aspects of his game like everybody else does. But I do feel he's got a, a huge um, uh, platform now to build and, and grow into the defender that he's going to be. We talk about the injuries and the schedule as well and you know what that's doing to, to a lot of teams in the Premier League right now, but how much is it teaching your set of players how to do things tough at the moment? Yeah, I don't think it's, you know, I wouldn't overplay it from our perspective. We're not in Europe, we don't have the overload of games that some clubs do, but I just think the, the demands of a Premier League player now, the physical demands every game is, there's no hiding place. I think when I look back to my career and some of the games that I played, there probably was physically a, a hiding place, but now it's um, it's end to end. It's huge transitions, sprints up and down the pitch. There's no breather. So the lads have to be fit. They know that. And I think as a group, Overall, we we are. You mentioned the atmosphere at St James Park. We, we seem to talk about it every single week. What makes it extra special under the lights at St James's Park? Yeah, it is. It's I don't know quite how to describe it, but it is. There's there's a different feeling in the night games. Um, there's a an even more. Um, try and pick my words carefully. Well, an aggressive but positive feeling um, and I think we thrive off that aggression from the crowd we um, we want and crave that really because we want to show that energy and that that uh, the passion to win so I think the crowd have, have really given us that in the evening games and hopefully it will be another special one against Everton and just on Everton obviously they, they endured a difficult season last time around doing a lot better this time around how well has Frank Lampard do you do, has done do you feel in terms of just steadying a bit of a rocky ship there I think he's done a very good job I know Frank well from Various encounters, playing with the under-21s with him many years ago. Um, yeah, very, very likeable man and I think he's done a really good job. As you say, he stabilised the club. Really difficult um, situation um, for them last year. But I think he's made some astute signings in the summer. I think now they're a much tougher team to play against. So, yeah, we expect a difficult game. And just finally from me, I was noticing just before I came into this press conference on social media, the fans have voted overwhelmingly for you to dye your hair peroxide blonde like Bruno was <laughs> after the conversation last week. Are you paying any trip to the barbers anytime soon? Or? I'm not planning to. Um, I'm not sure how that would actually look in reality. As you age, I'm not sure it's something I would probably want to see in the mirror. <laughs> Man, thanks. Thank you. Mark? Morning, Eddie. Uh, just, just one for me. Um, we've talked about injuries and we've got the World Cup break coming up. While if you playing well going into that break, it might be a sort of a, a chance to stop the momentum. But do you think in your case, with sort of muscle injuries and other injuries you've had, it could be a useful thing to get, get a reset in terms of the, the overall fitness of the squad? I always try and look at things positively. So yeah, we'll, we'll look at it that way. A, a break gives us a chance, hopefully, to get Alex in full, um, up to full speed and the same with, with Alan. Yeah, there's no point looking at anything negatively. So we look at the break as a chance for hopefully the players that do go away to do really well for their respective countries and for us to get hopefully a full complement of players back. OK, thanks, broadcasters. Damien? Um, Eddie, when you talk about the demands that have been put on players now and the condensed programme, are you concerned <coughs> that we're asking them to do too much? Does it become unhealthy or unhelpful? Or um. <coughs> No, I, I don't. I, personally, I don't think so at the moment. I think the only question mark I'd have is for the probably the international players and maybe the European clubs. I think their schedule is much more difficult than ours. So I, I feel for the players sometimes when you have a really condensed period of games and then they're going away and play for their countries, they get no respite either physically or mentally. Um, but they also get the reward of playing for their country in, in a major tournament. So it's, it's offset, obviously. It's a, a great thing for them and their careers. So no, personally, from our situation here, I think we're, we're OK. Just going back to something Reza asked about uh, when you talked about the balance of the team, Rafa Benitez in his time he used to talk about a, a short blanket where he could keep either your, 
your feet or your head warm, but not both at the same time. Do, do you have you been able to stretch that blanket with the, the signings you've made? Oh, a lovely way of putting it. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure I necessarily a agree with the the blanket uh, analogy. Um, all I do is try and pick a team um, and try and produce a, a style of play that fits and tries to get results for the club. So I, I don't look at it any other way. Yes, of course, you need a balance. Just like everything, you need um, you need to attack well and defend well together. Um, it's, it's obviously my job to try and put that together. Thank you, Craig. Uh, two questions, any different subjects. First of all, with regards to the injuries and in, you know, your team specifically, but by their own admission, the players have said that you know, since you've come in, training's changed, there's a different level of intensity, fitness, all the rest of it. Is it just a case of, with regards to the muscle injuries, players' bodies adapting to this newfound schedule and intensity and all the rest of it? No, per personally, I don't think so. I think uh, naturally during a season you'll, you will get injuries. It's our job when you do get injuries to get those injuries um, as a football club back onto the pitch in a safe and controlled way. So the re-injuries, that's where I say they become that that's a complete no-no for us and that's something we need to learn from and make sure that it doesn't happen again because as I said earlier, you're always going to get fresh injuries at any stage. But if you're not getting your players back when they've got, been injured before, suddenly you have a very difficult situation. So it's our job to get those players back fit and healthy and on the pitch. And uh, I don't know how you answer this, but Nick Profi, uh, Jordan Pickford tomorrow night, who would you pick? Well, I'm, I'm pleased and proud to pick Nick. Um, he's been outstanding since he's walked through the door. Uh, every, um, every game he gives us all, every training session, he's a very professional lad. So yeah, I wouldn't um, I wouldn't swap any, uh, Nick for anybody, and I think he's proved in his very short time with us uh, what a capable goalkeeper he is. Luke, I guess over the course of the campaign, this is going to really test the depth of your squad today for every football club in the Premier League. Yeah, I think when you get these three game weeks, we've always found the three game weeks are difficult um, from a physical perspective. If you pick the same team through the games, that's not to say you can't, but it, it tests the players to the maximum. Um, and yeah, in this moment of time where we're losing a couple of players, that makes it even more difficult to rotate potentially where you would like to. So um, we're tested this week, but it is what it is, and we're looking forward to the games. And how, how's Joe Willock? Is he, is he better than he was at the weekend? Is he, is he probably fit enough to start if you need him? He's definitely better than he was at the weekend, yeah. We've seen him. He's uh, hopefully be training today, so yeah, he's in a better place. And what do you make of his season so far? I think we saw probably have one of his best games of the season just before the match. Yeah, I think Joe is improving uh, week on week. I think he um, has high standards and expectations of himself. I think he wants to be a regular goal scorer, a regular goal creator. That hasn't quite happened yet. Um, but he's been in the positions and he's been very, very close to scoring two or three goals in, in training. I think he's a regular goal scorer. So I think those moments will come and fall for him. But his athleticism and his energy and his ability to get around the pitch has been a vital uh, component of our team. Okay. Dominic? You mentioned Fabian Cher playing for a slight injury for a while, but still playing every week, best defence in the league. What does that show about his importance to the side individually? Yeah, Fabi's a hugely important part of our, our team. He's been a consistent performer for us. He, I thought he had an excellent game against Manchester United. Really, really good. Together with Sven, they had to play very well in order for us to get anything in a, a difficult away game. His use of the ball is very good, he's very composed, but I think the last few games, I think if there's been a growth in his performance, has been his defensive mindset has been very consistent, um, very brave with his defending. So yeah, I've been pleased with the pair of them the last few games. I think they've, they've formed a good partnership. You've mentioned bargain signings the past 12 months for £3 million around that. For him in 2018, where does he rank in terms of a bargain signing? Yeah, I mean, that's... That's a, an incredible piece of business when you look back. Um, three million pounds, you don't get a lot these days for that. Um, and Fabi certainly proved his worth for us. John? Uh, a bit of a random one on this, but in terms of your Newcastle squad, when you say that, right, is there a player or, or players that are unsung heroes in your team? I think whenever you see a squad that the manager will say there's always unsung heroes, there's ones that maybe don't get the acclaim and the praise maybe nationally, media-wise, even amongst your own supporters, but you see the value of them behind the scenes. I think we've got a number of those here. Um, when I think of Mark Gillespie, Paul Dummett, your local lads that have come through and uh, know how much the club means to them, but also how much they mean to us. Uh, they're just incredible 
guys that love their football club and um, we're lucky to have them here. So I'm picking two, I could probably pick more, but they're two that immediately spring to my to my mind. Okay. Kieran? Eddie, um, Jurgen Klopp congratulated Newcastle and he said that you know, having no ceiling, but Liverpool are a club that have a ceiling. I don't expect you to respond to that comment, but do you see it maybe as a compliment that clubs like Liverpool are taking over what you guys are doing on and off the field? Yeah, I think it's a difficult one because I think it's probably been used in the wrong way. I think what Dan meant with his comment was there's no ceiling to our ambition. I think long term, the club have huge plans and want to go to places um, that the club, um, yeah, uh, huge ambitions. But at the moment, the reality of what we're working towards or working with, it, it, there is a ceiling because of all the things that I've sat here and explained every week financial fair play we're still in a training ground that's being renovated so we're, we're not living that life that is being discussed we're living a very different reality our wage bill is very controlled we're trying to do things in a very stable and controlled way there's been no lavish although we spent money on players it's not been extravagant or out of sync I think with the rest of the Premier League so I think that it has to be careful or everyone has to be careful with with comments and opinions um, that's just my belief. I mean, your team's gone to Old Trafford and maybe upset supporters there, gone to Anfield's upset supporters there. I mean, what have you made of that? That you know, Newcastle are going to these grounds now and, and maybe doing the ugly stuff really well? Well, we want to be competitive and we don't want to be um, looked at as soft touches or we're just turning up to entertain. We, we want to t turn up and win and compete. And to do that, I think you have to be. Uh, you, you can't look at teams and, and overly respect them too much. You just have to play the game and you have to play the game hard and fair. And that's what we've tried to do in every game this season. So we'll continue with that method and that approach. Um, we'll just do our thing. We're not really too worried what other people think about us. Okay. Martin? Sorry, is, is that perception of the club just kind of throwing money around, which isn't correct? Is, is that, does that frustrate you at all? Uh, frustrate? No, I don't, I don't spend my time worrying about it. But I, I just... <coughs> When you know the reality, then you know the truth of what we've done since, well, certainly since I've been here, I can only speak on my behalf. And we've tried to do things in a very um, controlled way. And certainly the club could have gone a totally different way, I'm sure, with with the takeover and everything that, the, um, that came with that takeover and everything that was sort of talked about. I think we've done it in the opposite way. We've done it in a very cool, calm, our wage bill has been very, very controlled. So we, again, we haven't splashed <coughs> the money that maybe that people thought we would have done initially. So, yes, the ambition is huge in the long term, but in the short term, we're we're trying to improve everything we deliver for our, for our players, as I've said many times, and we're still working towards that. So um, we're a long, long way from where we want to be. One of the one does Nick Pope has the ambition have the ambition to be the I'm sure he does. I mean, I've not really sat down and discussed that with him. I've focused very much on Newcastle and trying to help him become the best goalkeeper that he can be. But I'm sure inside, if you speak with Nick, he's hugely driven. I think you can see that from his day-to-day -day work. Okay. Okay. Lee Ryder? Eddie, um, this game at Goodison last season was the night where the guy come on the pitch and tied himself the goal post um, at a time when you were probably on top in that game. Um, and then obviously... Sadly, went on to lose it. Are you fired up a little bit to, to get one over them just on the back of that? No, because I don't think that was anything to do with, with Everton, um, Frank and his players. That was just one of those moments. It was bizarre. Uh, ne never seen anything like that on a football pitch before. I didn't know initially what had happened. I had no idea. So certainly, no, there's no side of me that looks at Everton in that way. It was... As I say, it was just one of those things. I think our motivation is purely just trying to win and continue our good form. And yeah, at these early stages of the season, try and um, keep all the, the good feeling around the club. Yeah, I mean, Frank Lampard's been under pressure. Steven Gerrard's been under a bit of pressure. Do you, do you think some of the culture that's created by social media now can be a little bit over the top and you should be able to focus on your job a bit more? Ooh. Yeah, social media, I think, has created, I'm not blaming social media for everything, but it has created, I think, a very short-term um, swings of opinion. Yeah. I think that I think the swings just, you win one game, everything 
is good and you lose one game and everything swings the other way. And I think for, for a manager, I think it's really important when you're stuck in the middle of that is to try and be very calm and try and remember what you are the, despite the opinions of other people. And I think if you know inside what type of job you're doing, I think I can live with that. Okay, Chris Paul. Yeah. Yeah, two questions on different themes as well. First of all, uh, I mean, you mentioned Joe Willock and that he hasn't quite had goals to his game. I mean, without the likes of uh, Alexander Isak and Alan St. Maxwell for the next few weeks, do you need players like Joe Willock and Joe Linton to, to contribute goals over the course of the next few weeks, particularly against Everton tomorrow night when you couldn't break down Bournemouth three weeks ago? Yeah, certainly when you look at um, the makeup of our team, now we're Depending on what system we play, we need our attacking players to score. So whether we're playing a 4-3-3 or whatever system we play, we're looking for those key players in those positions to either assist or score. And if I look at, because um, we've been playing a 4-3-3, our number eight, that, that's a big expectation on them. And that won't change. So regardless of who plays in that position, um, goals is a requirement. And on another theme, a couple of managers have, have been shown red cards this season for, for the sort of con conduct on the touchline. Do you ever look back on how you've been on the touchline and think about the sort of impression that that gives and, and how that might filter down into academy? Or is it just part of the game now that, that you know you are so engrossed in it as a, as a coach that you might lose your emotions or whatever on the touchline? Yeah, I can't say I'll never lose my emotions because you, you don't know what the future holds. Um, I certainly try not to. I, I, I'm a, very aware that I'm a I'm going to be looked at by millions and millions of people, especially children, and I think you have an expectation to make sure the game is upheld in the right way, with the right spirit. And I'm certainly aware of my behaviour and demeanour on the, on the touchline. That's not to say I don't want to win, and I don't want to win with every fibre of my body I do, but I just, I've always had that inside me that um, not to lose my discipline. And, and also, my players are looking at me and what they're going to think of me if I'm I'm not going to be able to help them in that moment if I'm not in control of my emotions. So these are the things that I'm, I'm always aware of and thinking of. Okay, Oscar. Eddie, before you arrived here, I think the general consensus might have been you weren't the most defensively minded coach. So you've, you've turned the worst, one of the worst in the league, into the best statistically this season. Have you, have you surprised yourself? <laughs> wow, what a question. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's a strange one because for me, defending and attacking go hand in hand. And I've never and I had this reputation of not being a good, good defensive coach. Now, um, I didn't particularly like that. Um, but that's not to say that we've drastically changed our method and our approach. Of course, you're always looking to improve. And I think when I had my break, I went away and certainly looked at everything that I was delivering. And that, that would be along the lines of one thing that I thought uh, our defensive record at Bournemouth, I think wasn't very good. I think there are reasons for that, but uh, ultimately, yeah, I think you have to be very self-critical. I was. Um, we've gone away, we've worked at it. That's not to say that we have we know everything and we've fixed everything. I think defensive records are there probably to be analysed at the end of the season, not after 10 games. But it's something we've worked hard on and we will continue to work hard on with the players. But I've always said that I think the players deserve the credit who are delivering the performances. So you, and I look at the team and I don't want to credit just the back four. The team have defended well as a unit and that needs to continue in every game. What were your main takeaways from your time out of the game then on, the, on that subject? Again, when you ask me some of these questions, how long have you got, that would need to be a sit down conversation, So, which I probably wouldn't give you anyway. Um, <laughs> but it, it, it's, it's, yeah, it's quite deep and I think, um, yeah, hopefully we've made improvements to that side, but I still think there's more to come. And on, on Sven, I think it was in Austria when he just signed, you said that he was quite quiet among the group. Has he, has he come out of his shell in the last few months? Yeah, I'd say there's elements of his personality that have definitely come out and I, I think he's very popular amongst the squad. I think that the lads look at him and really like him and um, he's got a really nice sense of humour and he is still laid back and, and very calm around the around the players. Sort of how he performs is the mirror of his personality really. But he's a winner and he's fiercely determined and again, like the, the club really, very ambitious. Back for Luke. Yeah, sorry. Um, I may remind you, you did celebrate on the pitch on one game last season. Celebrating is different, though. Luke, <laughs> That's allowed. To yeah, well, I think, I think if you're looking at, I always tell my players when they score a goal, you've got to celebrate, uh, enjoy them, the good, the good moments, because you don't know when the next one's coming. So, I've got no issue with me celebrating. It's more the other way, 
losing my temper or losing control in a, in a negative and aggressive way, I'd, I'd try not to do that. And just going back to other managers talking about Newcastle, other clubs talking about Newcastle, is that a backhanded compliment? Can, can you see it that way, that you have the rest of the Premier League worried about where this club is going and heading? Uh, I don't know. I, I try not to spend too much time thinking about it. But I'm just aware that maybe one or two comments might not be totally accurate. That's when I have to stand up for us. Thank you. Okay. Simon? Yeah, it's back to Pulp and Pickford being at opposite ends. Um, when Jordan Pickford's come back to St James' Park being a Sunderland lad, he's always um, played kind of an emotional game. And I think to the extent that he was rested for one of the recent, recent encounters. Is that something you and your players can exploit and the crowd can exploit again? Because he seems to get wound up quite well St James' Park. I think for obvious reasons I'm not going to go into any detail on, on my answer. All I'll say with, with Jordan is a goalkeeper that we respect and you know, from my side I just hope that he's very busy um, with the game and we, we make him work. But um, no doubt having watched him over a long period of time he's a, an outstanding goalkeeper. And do you think that England battle between the two is a close battle and, and Nicky's really pushing Jordan? Through? I think all Nick can do is continue to play well for us um, and, he, and he has this season. And again at Old Trafford he didn't have really a lot to do, which is a really good sign for, for him and for the team. But what he did do, he did very well. Okay. Last one from Martin. So just to go back to that, are you, are you keen to kind of show the incremental uh, advancement the cast is making rather than say perhaps what PSG may be perceived to do, which is an awful lot of money thrown into the situation? Well, I don't think spending an awful lot of money sometimes is the solution anyway. Um, for us, we want to improve the infrastructure of the football club. We want to Im improve the environment the players are working in. And of course, you want to improve the team, but I think the best way to improve the team is, is is one part at a time. I think to do big, huge numbers of transfers doesn't work at one go. Um, that's not to say that it might work for somebody, but I think where we are, we've got some really good players um, and we need to add little bits and pieces with every transfer window and try and get stronger and stronger with a longer term vision.